<laughs> right. Um, it's, a, no, it's a perfect segue into maybe talking a little bit about governing and the question of governing. And here I'm hoping maybe we can play out a question I, I actually struggled with quite a bit. Um, it would seem to me that there are some limits on what a Shomer Shabbat observant person could do. Um, notwithstanding some very prominent examples to the contrary, obviously your own career. Um, I think of, you know, Ilan Ramon, a blessed memory, the Israeli astronaut, uh, who went up and was very particular in going on to that spacecraft that he would have kosher food and that things would sort of be in keeping with what a religious Jew uh, would need as part of that, that regime. Uh, and, you know, Rav Moshe Feinstein is perhaps the most famous posik in uh, American Jewish life who really kind of answered questions from all kinds of places. And he has this amazing tshuva where a guy is asking him, uh, because he's in a theater company, whether he can have a Gentile apply cold cream to his face to remove the makeup that he's put on for the performance on Friday before Shabbat, after the show's over on Shabbat. Right? And you can imagine Rav Moshe sort of sitting there saying, I can't believe I have to answer this. <laughs> uh, and yet answering it, right? And there is there's some aspect there of, well, the Torah has to go wherever people go. But that said, I wonder sometimes that maybe there are certain things that, no, actually they require a certain pattern of living that is antithetical to what it means to observe Shabbat. So I'm interested in maybe pushing you a little. I feel you have a, you have a very strong, I know both personally, but also it comes out in the book, this notion that Jews should be able to serve in representative government. Right? And a religious Jew should be able to serve uh, in that kind of role. And I want to ask, why? <coughs> Right? Why, why might we not say that Jews, at least in a Gentile diasporic government, right, may have to be among the represented and not among those doing the representing? And to the extent that I know you feel to the contrary, yeah. why? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, well, let me start from the American point of view, which is inclusive, which is that um, the vision that the founders had, I think, was that, uh, as expressed in the founding documents, was that everybody should have the opportunity to serve. I mean, they did something quite remarkable. That when they wrote the constitution, well, certainly the, the, yeah, the constitutional Article Six, I'll get to in a minute. That there were several of the original states that had religious qualifications for office. That you had to be a Christian, or you had to be a particular kind of Christian in some states. And the Founding Fathers came along in Article 6 and said uh, there can't be any religious test for holding office in this country. So, so my first answer goes to the, to the, uh, uh, to the Constitution. Um, the second is that, uh, you know, this is, let's see, how can I best and most briefly do this? This, this is a land in which we value equal opportunity, and I don't think anybody should be excluded, including observant Jews, from aspiring to, to any job, public or private, that they want to. I mean, one of the remarkable things that I've seen happen in my lifetime is uh, the opening up of almost every sector of uh, public and private life to uh, people who are religiously observant. Uh, and accommodations being made in the best sense of a lot of cases about accommodating to religious legal cases. But you know, it wasn't so long ago that most major law firms in this country, a lot of them, didn't accept Jews as partners. Today, some of those same firms <coughs> have kosher kitchens in the firm because they're accommodating to the people that they want to hire. So. Um, and of course, we have something else, and I'll go back to your, the specifics of your uh, question about representative government. We are blessed uh, not only to be in this extraordinary country with all the freedom it's given us and everybody else, but uh, we're, we're alive at a time when the state of Israel has been re-established, obviously. So now, for the first time in 2,000 years, we have a representative Jewish government, a state. And um, you know, obviously, for the most part, there are Jews holding office there and uh, carrying out responsibilities that require them to work on Shabbat. Um, in 
intelligence, law enforcement, defense, um, all of that stuff. And I, I try to pursue this a little bit in writing the book just to get a sense of what the what the rabbis in Israel have uh, poskened, you know, uh, ruled on this. And they've been quite accommodating to this because of, for, for a lot of Talmudic, from, based on a lot of Talmudic sources that you'd be better to <laughs> describe than I. Although I must say, in my, in, both in, in discussions I've had with rabbis as I was in my public life, and um, <coughs> research that I did just wanting to make sure that what I was writing was based in, in fact, uh, there are a lot of very old uh, Tom, rabbinical rulings, um, not just the, the most obvious of the Kohat Nefesh, allowing doctors and others to take, mandating or to take actions on Shabbat that you wouldn't otherwise be permitted to take for, for the purpose of saving or protecting life, but to do things that, well, like going to a Roman circus on Shabbat because that's where the power structure was, and maybe if the leaders of the Jewish community were there, they'd be able to create relationships that would be protective of the Jewish community. Now I say quickly, or one of them that I love is that at one point there was a Jewish rebellion against the Parthian Empire, and it appeared that the uh, uh, Parthian Empire was going to strike at the rebels on Shabbat, thinking they wouldn't fight. But uh, they were the rebels said they, sh they had to fight. And uh, of course the happy ending is that they won. <laughs> and anyway, there's a lot of precedent. Now, the, the important thing to say, and I'll stop here, is that unlike the Jews who went to the Roman circus, and Jews throughout a lot of the last 2,000 years, who were living in societies where um, they were not uh, really equal, um, today, you know, Jews occupy position, obviously in Israel, but even here, positions throughout the executive, judicial, and legislative branches of our government. So I don't know that a rabbi would say that a uh, leader of the Jewish community should go to a bar on Saturday because other leaders of the non-Jewish government were there uh, so that there could be a conversation. Yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, and the category, and you talk about it a bit in the book, of karov uh, la malchut, you know, someone who is uh, close to the government, and they're therefore given certain dispensations minimally to look like Gentiles and you sort of pass uh, in all kinds of ways that perhaps, you know, with, with a certain other kind of attire and since it's flying out, they might have a harder time doing. Um, there's a sort of deeper uh, question, I think, of how we move from that category to today being not karov uh, malchut, but in some cases the malchut, right? I mean, you're actually in the position of authority. I've always thought it's interesting, you know, when, particularly even in the, you know, when you think about halakha and you think about uh, psak and these rulings, you know, there's sort of the, the formal legal language that's being deployed to engage a certain situation, and then there is the actual effect of it. And what's interesting is that the, the I agree with you 100%, the consequences uh, that people and rabbis are willing to kind of underwrite, as it were, with, uh, with a legal uh, opinion, are often quite broad. Um, obviously, power plants run in Israel 24-7 uh, and any number of other kind of core Jewish institutions. But the legal language actually often is not quite that broad. That is to say, the standard way you explain that the power plants run in Israel is that while the hospitals need them, that's involving saving lives. Once you have to run it for the hospital, so you run it for everyone else. But in a way, it actually misses the essence of the point, which is that there's something about statecraft itself that demands some kind of response. I remember this was a, there were almost riots in Israel a few years ago when you know Kvish Misparachad, the main road from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, was going to be shut down uh, in order to move this major, what was it, an electrical uh, Component, right? It was a major component they had to shut down the entire road. Uh, and the only time they could do that without completely disrupting uh, the traffic flow was on Friday night. Right? And there was this sort of huge uproar of, well, this is not saving anyone's life at this moment. And in that sense, the Jewish state should stand tall for, yes, we're going to have impossible massive traffic jams for an entire day <coughs> in order to show what it means that we value Shabbat against voices that were saying, but without the legal language to express it, this is almost like in a separate category of what a state has to do. 
Um, and I, I myself am sort of torn about that because in a way, and we'll get to this a bit, but obviously what Shabbat stands for, going back to where we started, Shabbat is so deeply important that it does probably require some massive demonstration of inconvenience to honor it. Um, yet, that category, Karob Malchut, is fundamentally a kind of diasporic, powerless category in a way that modern Jewish power uh, is not so easily joined with. Uh, I think that's pretty well said. No, I, I, um, I agree. And I've been aware as I've gone along that I'm, I'm, at least in Congress, I've been, as a member of Congress, I've been breaking new ground. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, uh, you tell me whether you think this is appropriate. I said to my rabbi, let's have a conversation. And I want to uh, pose some questions to you, but I'm not asking you to paskin. I'm not asking you to rule. Um, I, I just want you to inform my decision, because I, I want to accept responsibility. Maybe I don't want to put responsibility on you. Maybe I'm not sure what your answer is going to be. <laughs> but I have been, so in deciding what to do on Shabbat or, not, or what not to do, it's not always been easy. And I will tell you, just to go this in there, I have never missed a vote that occurred on Shabbat. And sometimes, uh, some personal inconvenience, our family inconvenience. And I will tell you that because mo my colleagues don't want to be there on Friday night or Saturday, not because they Shabbat, but because they want to go home, they want to do something else. Uh, so usually, or even go further than that, on most occasions when there are votes on Friday night and Saturday, they're significant and arguably they could come within one of the uh, sort of exceptions. Although I, I try to do this in a way that I don't, most of the time I've been able to do it in a way that I don't break any of the uh, prohibitions of Shabbat. But I, I must be honest and say that I've been down there sometimes voting on issues that are not, uh, wouldn't come up to any of the standards. And um, I know that the reason for that is something probably more sociological or political, which is that it seemed unfair to me that uh, in offering myself as a candidate for the Senate from Connecticut, that I would um, essentially deprive the people of Connecticut of half of their representation in the Senate on those votes that occurred on Friday night or Saturday because of my Shabbat observance. There's another sense in which I must say, and this is sort of, you know, I don't know what category to put it in. I have realized that I'm doing something that hasn't been done before, and I don't want to ruin it for the people who are, the men and women who are Shabbat observant who are going to follow me, that somebody's going to say to them, oh, Lieberman, he wasn't there that night that there was the big vote on uh, school funding or whatever, because it was a Friday night. So it's, so I, <coughs> I certainly don't, claim perfection or purity here. There have been decisions I've made that have been close ones. Uh, and on the end, that's why I think that uh, I have to accept responsibility for them, not, not to blame them on uh, a rabbi's blessing. <laughs>